Hey people. So if I have never invited you to be a part of Praying Pastor M, let me apologize officially. And let me take this opportunity to invite you to be a part of a very growing family on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, please follow me at Pastor Mildred and join me 3 p.m. every day, West African time, to be a part of what we do. Um, it's just a time where we get to learn about the Word of God, have fun, talk about real life issues, and just connect with each other. So please be a part of it every day of the week, Monday to Saturday, 3 p.m. with p.m. Praying with Pastor M. God bless you. Hi everyone. So um, today is very special for me. I'm going to be talking to uh, a set of women who are very, very dear to my heart. Um, today I'm going to be talking to pastors' wives. I'm still doing the seven series, but I'm going to be talking to pastors' wives. And today I'm going to be talking about seven mistakes pastors' wives should not make. Okay? This one is a bit different. I know I always talk about the mistakes people make, but this one, <laughs> seven mistakes you must not make if you're going to have a happy life, a happy home, a happy marriage. Seven mistakes pastors' wives must not make. Um, I know sometimes that pastor's wives have it very hard. To be honest, it's one of the most unappreciated positions and jobs or lives. <laughs> people judge you unfairly, um, people have their opinions of how you should be, what you should be, who you should be. Um, and that can be very hard on any human being. People expect you to be a certain way. In fact, it's even harder if you are one of the women who didn't marry a pastor. So I always say that there are three kinds of pastor's wives. There are those who, from the day they were born, they knew they were created to be pastor's wives. They always wanted to be pastor's wives. They looked out for pastors. They wanted to be a part of all of that. Um, that's the first kind. And then there's the type of pastor's wife who um, just stumbled into it. So she married a banker, she married an engineer, she married a doctor. And then maybe three years, two years down the line, a married man starts to say, oh, I sense there's a call of God on my life. And that can be very hard because in your heart, you know you married a doctor. But what will you do? You've already said I do, so you must do. And then the third kind are the people like me who did not want to marry pastors, but somehow you can't run away from what God has planned and destined for your life. So with whatever way you found yourself here, I just want to help you. Um, to avoid some mistakes that these mistakes can be very costly so there are things that i think you should take seriously so i'm just going to get right into it the very first one the mis first mistake you must not make as a pastor's wife is to fight the church this is a very common mistake pastor's wife make. you are every time there's a problem in your marriage or in your home what you're thinking is it is the fault of the church my husband is so involved and invested in what's happening in church. He's not paying attention to me. My husband is so interested in everything that is going on in church. He's not really looking at the home. So you, instead of working with him to make sure things are working in church, you start to fight the church. You start to think that. You start to alienate yourself. You start to think, oh, it's me against the church. The truth is you are a part of the church. You are the church. So if you start to fight the church, it will not end well for you. Because if a man has a call of God upon his life, one of the things he will do is that he must fulfill that call. So he's not going to stop going for church meetings. He's not going to stop going for prayer meetings just because you're sulking or just because you're complaining or just because you're nagging. If anything, that will even push him away. Now, it's even very hard for you to think that you're going to fight God's wife. <laughs> because that's what the body that's what the church is the church is the bride of christ it is the body of christ so if you think that you're going to fight and win you need to ask apostle uh, saul he, he used to be apostle saul but apostle paul you need to ask him how that turned out for him now for those i mean i'm sure you know the story but for me a lot of times i like to relieve the experience of the bible so i, I literally try to walk through the bible and you know experience or think how they thought, experience what they experienced, ask myself questions when I look through the Bible stories. So looking at Apostle Paul's life, 
Apostle Paul at the time was Saul. And he didn't think he was doing anything wrong. If anything, he thought he was defending Christ and defending, you know, sorry, defending the um, God. That these people of the way, that's what they were called at that time, were destroying everything that they had been taught, the heritage, they had the legacy they had. And so he got, got permission to go and find them one by one, wherever they were, take from Jerusalem to kill them. And so he was on the way, and then Jesus accosted him there. Say, bright light came from heaven. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Um, let me see if I can read it. I, I love the way the um, easy-to-read version says it. It says, um, I'm reading verse, Acts of Apostles 26, verse 14. And it says that this is Apostle Paul speaking in his own words. He said, we all fell to the ground. Then I heard a voice talking to me in Aramaic. And the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You are only hurting yourself by fighting me. And that's really what I want to say to you today. You're only hurting yourself if you fight God. You cannot fight God and win. You can't fight the church and win. If there's a problem in your marriage, isolate the problem. The church is never the problem. It's never your problem. It's probably your husband taking his work too seriously, getting too involved in work. The sacrifices you're making are probably getting to you. I'm not being appreciated is probably getting to you. But you cannot fight the church. It says you are only hurting yourself. In pigeon, simply what it means is you go wound if you fight God, you will be injured. I'm telling you, no one can fight God and win. So if the church seems to be taking a lot from both of you, have those conversations with your husband. But do not make the church the enemy. Do not make church members your enemy. Um, don't think it's that sister who's always complaining. If you don't tell my husband things about me, you don't do this. And the truth is, I hear a lot of pastors' wives say, my husband is always taking their side. It's his job. Okay? It's his job. When you get home, you guys trash that out but do not fight the church. So that's the first thing that you must not do. The second one is very important. The second mistake you must not make as a pastor's wife is to misunderstand the concept of hospitality. Too many pastor's wives make that mistake. Listen to me. Let me say this to you. Hospitality is not the same thing as access. Hospitality is not the same thing as access. Too many people mistake the two. You think that just because you want to be hospitable, you bring people into your space, there must be your, your private space as a pastor's wife or as a pastor, someone in ministry. You cannot allow just anyone into your home. Listen, that spirit of discernment or that, um, that discerning spirit, you know, is where, this is the point where you need to use it. You need to have it and you need to use it. You need to know who should be allowed into your home and who should not be allowed into your home. There's a difference between having being, being nice to people when they come into your home and allowing them into your bedroom, allowing them into private secrets of your life. These things are so common among pastors' wives. Everyone thinks that, oh, because my husband is the pastor, everyone should have access into my home. Your home is not the church. I'll say that again. Your home is not the church. There should be boundaries. There should be boundaries. I know that everyone is your son and your daughter in the Lord, and I know how it can seem like everyone is, you know, loving you, especially when they start giving you gifts, they start doing things for you, everybody's mama you and mama you and papa you. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. We are not all Israel that are in Israel. You need wisdom. You need to apply wisdom. Not everyone should be given access. Yes, Bible says we should be hospitable. And in some, it says that in entertaining strangers, some have entertained angels. I agree. But you must have clear boundaries. There must be somewhere you drop the line. Your children do not belong to the church. Everyone must not carry your child. I've seen pastors' wives who just literally come to church and have no idea where their children are. And so a lot of children are being molested, a lot of children are being abused right there in their own homes because everyone is coming in. You have to create clear boundaries for your children, clear boundaries for church members, clear boundaries for family members. So when people come into your home, your children should know those who are related to you. Everyone is not uncle. So just this uncle, that uncle. Children grow up confused because they don't know who is really an uncle and who is not make have very clear boundaries very very clear boundaries let me read a scripture to you that um really really touched me when i saw it 
um, I read to you Isaiah 39, verse. It's a bit of a, a read. Um, but what happened here was after um, King Hezekiah was ill, and then the Lord sent the prophet to him, and he prayed, you know, turned his face to the wall, and he prayed and he cried and asked God to allow him to live. God had told him that he was going to die, he put his house in order. And God to, he, he prayed, and God heard his prayer. While the prophet was still in the courtyard, just before he left, the Lord told him to go back and tell Hezekiah that he would add to him 15 more years. However, those 15 more years were not necessarily a good idea. Because see what happened. Um, after he got better, the Bible says that at that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent some men with letters and a gift to Hezekiah when he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And this made Hezekiah very happy. See, it's gifts. Mama, gifts, gifts. Should I make something for you? Should I buy something for you? Mama, I bought you a vegetable. Mama, I bought you egg. Mama, I bought you flour. That's it, gifts. Gifts can pervert. That's what the Bible says. It confuses. And then said, and this made Hezekiah very happy. So he showed them all the valuable things in his storehouse. They came to visit. All he needed to do was be hospitable. But he gave them access. He says he showed them the silver, the gold, the spices, and the expensive perfumes. He showed them the building where he stored the weapons. He showed them everything in his treasuries and everything in his house and throughout his kingdom. Then Isaiah the prophet went to the king Hezekiah and asked him, What did these men say? Where did they come from? And Hezekiah said, These men came all the way from Babylon just to see me. That must have made him feel really good. And so Isaiah asked him, What did they see in your house? I remember that when the prophet speaks, he's speaking as an oracle of God. So this was God literally asking him. That so, yes, these people came. Very good. They came with gifts. Beautiful. So when they came into your house, what exactly did you show them? As a pastor's wife, you need to understand that there must be clear boundaries. Don't open your bedroom. Show them everything. This is the shoe someone bought you. This is the, this is the, I mean, people just have... <laughs> You know, you think that everyone is happy for you. You need to understand. And I'm not teaching you to be suspicious or anything. I'm teaching you to be wise. It's very important that you have very clear distinctions on what hospitality is and what access is. And God asked him, he said, so where did these people come from? As if God didn't know. And said, what did they see in your house? If it didn't matter, I don't think God would have asked him. And he said, Hezekiah said, they saw everything in my palace. I showed them all my wealth. Hmm. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen to this message from the Lord All-Powerful. He said, the time is coming when everything in your house and everything that your ancestors have saved until today will be carried away to Babylon. Nothing will be left. He says, the Lord All-Powerful said this, the Babylonians will take your own sons and your sons will be officers in the palace of the kings of Babylon. I don't want to go into what, what Hezekiah answered because that showed the state of his heart. But the truth of the matter is that this showed me clearly that God makes a very clear distinction between being hospitable. God expects us to be hospitable. He's the one that says we should entertain even strangers and shows us how um, Abraham entertained strangers and they turned out to be angels. But he's very clear on access, who and who you give access. That is so important. Who you give access to your husband, who you give access to your children, who, give, who you give access to your life. Not every food they bring. Mama, I cook this thing. Not everything you eat. Not everything. You must have the spirit of God to be able to discern and say, oh, this person should be in my space. This person should not be in my space. Should we love everyone? Absolutely. Absolutely. Should we be hospitable? Absolutely. Should we help anyone that comes out? Yes. But must they enter into your house? No. Must they enter your bedroom? No. Must they have your husband's ear? No. Must they have access to your children? No. So you must differentiate between hospitality and access. So don't make that mistake. The third mistake, thinking that you belong to the church. <laughs> this one is so common. You must never assume that because your husband is the pastor of the church, that you now belong to the church. What it does is that it makes you feel entitled. So you feel like, oh, we're pastors of this church, so everyone should do things for me. Everyone should do this for me. Everyone should buy things for me. Everyone should gift me. Everyone should call me mama. Everyone should love me. Listen, God taught me this many years ago. First year in our marriage, God said to me, not everyone will love you because you are the pastor's wife, but you must love everyone 
because you are the pastor's wife. Very clear rules. God established it for me very early on. Listen, when people do things for you, do not assume that they did it for you for free. Let me just say this. A lot of pastors wives have long truths. I don't know the I don't know the what I don't know the English for long truths. Long truths. If you don't know in, long truths English, I don't know. Long truth cha. They have long truths. That in feeling of entitlement. Because I'm a pastor's wife. So somebody in your church is selling hair. You just you just order the hair. Give me three there. Knowing fully well that you don't have a dime to pay for it. And you assume this is where people live. This is what this is what they do to earn a living. It is not your right. If people do things for you, say thank you. If you want to ask for something, say please. Don't say, hey, come here. Don't know I'm your mama. What's that? How? How are you, dear mama? What? It's a privilege and an honor if people do things for you. So don't feel like, oh, because I don't assume. Never assume that because your husband is in ministry and you're in ministry that people should do things for you. Don't assume that, oh, the church, the church should do everything for us. No. The church is not your church. The church belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. And he said he will build his church. And listen, if you don't do the work well, you'll be replaced. You're not a permanent feature. If you don't do it well, God will replace you. Because it is his work. It is his body. And he will build his church himself. So the third mistake you must never make is to begin to feel like, oh, the church, I belong to the church. So I have, I'm entitled, I deserve everything I get, I should do anything I say, people should listen to me. Absolutely not. That's a mistake that you will make that will be too costly for you. Number four. The fourth mistake. Hmm. This one, as a human being, <laughs> I think nobody should make this mistake, but especially as a pastor's wife, you cannot even afford to make this mistake. It's a mistake you cannot afford. Number four. Thinking prayer is optional. Hey, if you think anything is optional in, in this life, prayer can be one of them. I don't think this, I don't think you can do marriage successfully without prayer. No. I don't think you can do ministry successfully without prayer. No. I don't think you can do life as a whole successfully without prayer. How? Have you lived before? Have you been married? Even if you've been married before, have you married to this person before? Even if you have. See, one of the things I've learned, especially in being married to a pastor, apart from being married as a whole, being married to a pastor, is a bit different. Especially if you want to do it God's way, it's a bit different from being married to just anybody. Now, for me, my husband is my pastor. For some other people, they can isolate those two roles because their husband is not their pastor. So sometimes I've seen women who would never disrespect their pastors because they understand that he's a man of God disrespect their husband you don't get that luxury so i've seen women who say see i've respected you enough for if you try me i'll tell you man you can't you know you can't do that you can't fight your husband because he's your pastor that's when that scripture touch not my anointed will become more real to you you won't be able to do anything so in situations where your husband has done something you don't like what do you do you pray if he's doing something you like and you want him to continue, what do you do? You pray. If you want him to do something for you and you can't convince him to do it, what do you do? You pray. So how is prayer an option? As a pastor's wife, I don't even think, as a human being, first of all, I don't think prayer is optional, but as a pastor's wife, especially for you, prayer is not optional. Let me tell you another reason why. Your husband is in ministry. Maybe you are in ministry as well, but I'm not as you, because there are people who are actually pastor's wives and are not in ministry. Your husband is in ministry, which automatically means that he's a target for Satan. Because he's, he's building God's kingdom. He's fighting for God's house. He's raising godly seed for God. You know, he's, he's, um, he's teaching people the word. He's exposing the lies of Satan. And you think Satan is going to sit around and just be sulking. Satan has an agenda. And he is consistent and intentional about making sure that that agenda comes to pass. Your husband is a target. And you are there fighting him rather than praying for him. It doesn't make any sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Prayer is something you can't even play with. Listen, I tell women, I don't know why we do this, but a lot of us, especially as pastor's wives, when you treat Satan as a nuisance, you miss the point. Satan is not a nuisance. He's an enemy. 
And an enemy, the difference between a nuisance and an enemy is a nuisance just wants to annoy you. An enemy wants to kill you. The Bible makes it clear that Satan comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He wants to kill you. That's the end goal. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal from you. He wants to destroy your reputation and your generation. So you cannot treat Satan like he's a nuisance. You can't say shoo. You don't say shoo. You say malika tosa da bahande gede le makadu shata. Now Satan, in the name of you don't you don't do all those things. Your child is your child is misbehaving, and he says it's just a child. It's not a child. It's not a child. Your children are different from every other person's child. Your own child is in a covenant. Do you understand? Is a that's in is is you have to suck. Hmm. He's born to offering to the Lord. Do you understand? It's not how other people are saying. It's just a child. Yeah, yeah, we grow. Pastors' kids are endangered. Satan goes after them specially. So you just wake up in the morning. You think it's the same way other people put on TV for their children that you put on TV for your own children. You won't put the word in. You won't get involved in raising them. And so how do you know how to raise them? The Bible says, train up a child in the way you should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. How do you know the way your child should go if you are not praying? Hmm. Prayer is not optional. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. It says they are mighty through God. They are mighty through God. Which means we have weapons. The only difference is that our weapons are not carnal. We have weapons. There's a way we fight. Then the people that even surround your husband, the people that are speaking into his life, whether from above or below, the people he submitted to, there are some people that God will tell you, start praying. That relationship must be disconnected. There are people that are following your husband. That God will say, you start praying. Lot must go. Lot must leave your husband. It was after Lot left that God said to Abraham, now, look. So that means that he didn't want to, there are some things that God will not say around some people. Until Lot left, God didn't say anything. It was when he left, God now said, hey, now you are serious, now Abraham. Because when I called you, I called you alone. And I wanted to bless you. But you carry, carry Lot to join body. There are many Lots following your husband about. How will you drive them peacefully? Prayer. I honestly don't know how a pastor's wife, a human being, first of all, I don't know how you are doing without prayer, but as a pastor's wife, it's not even optional now. Because the person you are playing with is not playing with you. Satan is not playing with you. He's not joking. He's on an agenda. You are playing. You are busy thinking it's ordinary. The way my husband is behaving today, well, when he comes back, I'm going to tell him the heart of the king is in God's hands, not in your hands. Your king's heart is in God's hands. A man's egos are very fragile. You handle it with prayer. You don't handle it with, if I just tell you my mind, which mind? You still have mind, that's why. You, when you get to the point where your mind is renewed, you know that it's only the word that works. So prayer is not an option. And how do you pray if you don't know the word? So studying the word is not even an option. So that's a mistake you must not make. You cannot avoid prayer. As a pastor's wife, you must be a praying woman. You must be a praying wife. You must be a praying mother. You will pray. That's in fact, you pray until you become prayer. <laughs> you pray till there's nothing else because that's the only way to deal with life. That's the only way. Somebody brings, I mean, there have been times, oh God. It's, it's like being in a war zone. It's like being in a war zone. The thoughts that come to your head, the things that, the attacks, the spiritual attack, except, <laughs> except you're not telling yourself the truth. Ask pastors why to have gone ahead of you. The spiritual attacks you face at night. I don't know about you, but there are times when my husband has said, oh, we're going to do this thing in this season. And all of a sudden, it seems like every night I can't fight. I can't sleep. It's one bad dream, one person fighting, one person saying, and I have to keep speaking the word. And I have to keep praying. So that those things will come to us. You just see there are seasons where things just seem to be locked up. You, you can't but pray. I don't even know. There's no point trying to convince you. I'm just telling you that that's a mistake you cannot make. It will be too costly. You need to be hearing God. You need to know that my husband is about to do this thing. God, is it what he should do? Give me, an, give me a word so that I can confirm for him that this is... You, are, you can't play, you can't sleep, you can't become I've arrived. You can't be sitting there and be wearing hats up and down and be telling people, bless you, bless you. Bless. You think that's the work? Pray. You have no other option. You pray for your children. Pray for your church members. You pray for your church. Pray for your husband's work. Pray for his life. Pray for his success. Pray that he will not be distracted. Pray that he will keep speaking the word of God. That he will not be carried away. That he will not, uh, that he will not be deceived. That he will not fall into the wrong hands. That he will, not, he will always have sound doctrine. That will rightly divide the word of truth. Honestly, 
you cannot but pray for your husband that you walk in the pathway for his life every day are different ways i always tell you there are different ways to get to the market but there's one way for your husband so for some other people is preach faith meetings for me my husband's one was relationship interestingly my husband didn't even want to do it this instagram now that everybody is instagram pastor instagram, my husband didn't want to get on instagram but i knew that that was where god wanted it i opened up the instagram thing by force i opened it i come and sit in front of him because i had prayed and god had given me wisdom Open it for him. Stop arguing with him. I open it. Put it. Put your picture. Put, put his picture. Of it. So is it only our picture? Put picture of service. He's interested in people. And then God gave me wisdom. Because my husband is in ministry, he understands people. He loves people. Once your husband is a pastor, that usually is their weakness. They love people. So God said, this is his weakness. The only way to get him there is to tell him that that's where people are. So I said to him, this is where people are. You can really get to see. Said, hey, how does it work? I say, you follow them. When you follow them, you see what's happening on their timeline. So anytime they put a picture, it shows up on your own. Hey, hey. So what I say, and you can look, you see what they are wearing, you see how they are dressed, you see whether the thing you are preaching is entering there. And that's how my husband today became serious about Instagram. And today he's preaching, he's using, he's using it as a tool to help marriages. Listen to me, prayer. Prayer is, and I'm not saying just be blasting tongues anyway, man, da, 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 no, mindless prayer, that's not what I'm talking about. Have proper conversations with God. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? How do you want me to do this thing? So the next thing, prayer. And I can stay and teach your prayer for 12 hours, so let me move. Prayer is not optional. That's a mistake that you can't afford. You cannot think that prayer is optional. So number five, we're getting closer to the end. Number five, forgetting that you live in a glass house. This one makes me laugh specially. As a pastor's wife, hmm, it's not everything that you see that you say, oh, because your life is out there. You are the perfect example for judge not or you will be judged. Your children, you can't judge and I'm shouting at other people's children. Your own children are there. Hmm. I don't want to go, to go into Proverbs, but I was about to drop on Proverbs of you people, but let me leave it for next time. Listen, those who live in glass houses don't throw stones. Remember that your life is out there for, on display for all to see. Package yourself. Even if, if I'm not saying pretend, but package yourself well. Your children, well. Your husband, well. Anything you don't want people to say, don't do. Anything you don't want people to repeat, don't say. Anything you don't, don't you can't, you can't have double standards. You can't wear one funny thing and then expect people in your church not to wear it. Story. <laughs> so you live in a glass house. Everything you do is on display, whether you like it or not. So you have to be careful how you talk, what you say, who you allow in. Everyone can see your life. And sometimes it can be very hard. I remember when I was um, trusting God for children. And I always tell people, I think fertility is hard. Very hard. It's harder in the public eye. It's harder when you have to do it in the public eye. Trust me. So people saw my pain, different kinds of levels. And God kept telling me, listen, you must be strong. Because this is what you, what you want to project, is what you want to see happen in other people's lives. So you must be strong. So even when there were times when I just wanted to break down, I didn't allow myself to break down. Because whether you like it or not, the same way, okay, so I'll give you an example. Um, the story, the book of Esther tells us about Queen Vashti. And when the king sent for Queen Vashti, Queen Vashti did not come. Now, that's a totally different argument, whether what she did was right or wrong, I'm not even going to go there. Now, the important thing is that the king sent for her, she didn't come. So the king was angry. And the king said, what should be done to her? And his advisors, because we're people. Very hard to know. The same were people that still come to a palace and give them drink, everything. They said to her husband, you must remove her. What insolence. Remove her. Because if you don't remove her now, um, the, our own wives too will think, if this woman can do it to, to the king, then why can't we do? And then the thing will start to spread. And interestingly, that's how you are as a pastor's wife. You are, whether you like it or not, and I can guarantee you, <laughs> whether you like it or not, it will happen. Whether you like it or not, you'll be the standard for a lot of people. So you must understand that people are watching you. That's pretty much what I'm saying when I say you live in glasses. People are watching you. You'll be amazed. You start to wear a hairstyle. And after a while, you look around you. If you're being honest with yourself, look around you. You see that a lot of people are wearing it. You wear a certain style. Look around you. Whether you like it or not, people are wearing the same thing. So if you don't want to see something reproduced in your church, you need to understand that people can see what you are doing. People can see how you're acting. So as a child of God, as a pastor's wife, what do you want to set out there? 
People are watching you. So you live in a glass. Your children, so how you are raising your children is important. People are watching you. Now, I'm not going to say um, because people are watching you, you start to pretend. No. I'm saying live your life in a way that is honorable to God because people are watching you. Okay? So that's the next mistake. Do not forget that you live in a glass house. Um, number six. Even though I've said that, let me see this one now. Even though I've said don't forget you live in a glass house. I need to say this so I can balance it out. Um, the mistake you must not make is to forget to live for an audience of one. Now people are fickle. People have opinions. If you become a puppet, they will tear you apart. Some people want a pastor's wife who is hot. Some people want one that is gentle. Some, so people are pulling you in different directions. I will, this is how pastor's wife should be. This is how pastor's wife should be. Listen to me. You must live for an audience of one. How does God want you to be? That's what's important. I, when you look at the story of Mary and Martha, common stories, and I'm using very common stories because, I mean, they're things you can identify with. As a pastor's wife, people expect you to be a Martha, but they want you to have the heart of a Mary. So everyone expects you to be, you know, hospitable. And that's exactly what Martha was doing. Martha was, what was expected. Martha was doing what was expected. How can Jesus be coming to your house? You're now going to lie down and be gisting. Are you, are you on something? Jesus, even if I'm, well, I'm going far, there's somebody that won't come to your house. As a pastor's wife, you know you throw down. You do everything. You do you do Chinese, you do local, you do pastas, you do this, you do all kinds of things on that table. You cook, you make sure that anything they ask for, if his grilled fish is there, grilled sausage is there, chicken is there, beef is there, you do turkey, you just the whole works. Plantain, jollof rice, fried rice, you do a father rice. Only for one person that is coming, you do all these things. And I probably I suspect that that's what Martha was doing. Martha was trying to do everything to please Jesus. I don't think she was just being busy. You know, sometimes people say that, that hey, don't be a matter, don't be busy. I don't think that was the issue. I don't think it was just that she was busy. I think it's that she got distracted by what really mattered. That was the real issue. So she was cooking, because you just come to your house, you go try different things. Like you, go cook, you go cook every soup, you go cook banga, you go cook uh, banga rice, you go cook okra, you go cook vegetable. Then you say, no, he doesn't like it, he not so you cook it for you, know, just in case that's what he feels like. Then, ah, maybe he's even in the mood for Amala. Then you turn Amala. Then you, does he want to do a way do with Begiri? You are going online and say, oh, maybe Jesus is a being some young kind of person. You start cooking different things before you know it. You're getting carried away. You're wondering, ah, where is ice block? Where is this one? Then you're trying to get everything ready. And the frustrating part was Jesus came early. And he's like, I think so. But why was she still cooking? And Jesus was there. Jesus was there and his sister just went and sat down with Jesus. But Jesus said something that changed my own life. Because human beings, <laughs> when I first got married to my husband, I had issues with identity because I assumed that there's a way pastor's wife should be. And all the pastor's wife I knew before I came on board were very soft spoken, very gentle, you know, very, if you do something, no matter what you do to them, bless you, bless you. They wear pretty hats, they sit in front, you know, they're very, you know, their husband is shooting something, they are beside him. And then he's talking and they're sitting beside him, just nodding. You know that pastor's wife nod and smile. They all be nodding and then the man now say, and then mama, what do you have to say? Then she will not turn and say, as papa said, all those kind of things. I said, no, it's not happening to me. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I am not that kind of person. You know, so I had all kinds of things in my head. How, I'm not, first of all, I'm not so so good. How am I so so good? If the thing they pepper my body, I could talk. You know, I just had all this kind of, and then I can't see something and just let it pass. If something is wrong, I will fix it. I'm not even going to go and look for someone to do it. So I was very, very hands-on, you know. So I had all those kind of things in my head. And But people had their notion of how Pastor K's wife should be. Pastor K's wife should be friendly with everybody. And, you know, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily a people person. I can't really say I am now, but God is helping me. I wasn't necessarily a people person. And I was okay with that, you know. So it was confusing and very conflicting for me. I struggled with how should I be. Until one day when I was praying and God dropped this word in my heart. He said only one thing is needful. Only one. Not all the things you are trying to do. Only one. Am I happy with you? How is your work with me? So as much as I'm saying realize that people are watching. I'm also saying remember that your most important audience is that you live for an audience of one. That's your biggest assignment. That you live for one person. That is God. Do the right things. Be who you should be. Be lovable. Be kind. No, maybe not lovable. Be loving. <laughs> be loving. Be kind. Be generous. Be hospitable. 
But remember that if you do all these things and God is not pleased with you, you've wasted your time. So don't make the mistake of thinking people are more important than God. Public opinion. You know, Herod wasn't even crazy. It was when people started praising him that he now started feeling like, oh, feeling like a God. And God now brought him down. Maggots were coming out of him. Don't follow the mouth of people. People will tear you to shreds. You must know who sent you, what he sent you to do, and why you should do it. And, very, and, and you know, it's, it's so important that you understand your identity because um, one of the things I've noticed that a lot of pastors' wives don't even know the work. And that's a huge mistake they make. I didn't want to make it, I, don't, I didn't want to give it its own number. But I think that it's important that I still bring it up as a byproduct of this. You must understand that your first job and what you're really called to do is to be the pastor's wife. Not position, not glory, not glamour. I know when I remember when I met my husband, my husband said to me, even if you are not called to ministry, I would marry you because I, I feel like you are my wife. And so don't forget to wife your husband. I'll say that again. Don't forget to wife your husband. Don't, don't forget to be his wife. To take care of him, his needs, love on him, nurture him, help him. It's not about ministry. So if your husband was not doing ministry, if your husband for any reason decides, oh, I'm not pastoring anymore, would you still be what he would value as a wife? I told my husband, if you want to go and be baking bread, eh, you, the, way I will, the way I will change it, you will not even believe, the way I will move into researching about bread, the different kinds of bread we can bake, how we can do, where can we get the best stuff. For, the important thing is that you remember to help your husband. You must be a help that is neat for him. You must be suitable for him and adaptable to his needs. So if he decides that he's not doing ministry again, for any reason, would you lose your position in his life as his wife? Or the only thing you're good for is to go and sing in the choir or to preach a great sermon, but your home is suffering. Don't make the mistake of sacrificing your role as the wife of the pastor for a position of pastor's wife. That's very key. Don't let your, uh, your role suffer because of position. A lot of people like the glam, and the, but there's work to be done on the ground. So don't get carried away by the fact that, oh, we're in ministry. If your husband decides, I'm going to walk away from all of this and just love the Lord, would you still be essential in his life? So that's so important. Remember that you're living for another and so on. What did God send you to do in his life? That's what you should be focused on doing, okay? Then the last mistake, and this is so important, this is a mistake that you must never make. If you do, it can destroy your home, can destroy your life. Never make the mistake of forgetting that your husband is first a man. Even though he's a man of God, never forget that he's first a man. Too many pastors' wives have put their husbands on pedestals. So, you make the mistake of thinking that your husband is now a demigod. I know the Bible says you are God before you get into that argument. But making that mistake of putting him on that platform where he thinks that he's infallible, he can make no mistakes, he now becomes arrogant, he gets caught up. Listen, your husband is first a man for a man of God. So that means you must make room for weaknesses. Don't say things like, how could you, pastor? Don't do those kind of things. He's a human being. He has needs. He has pains. He has moments when he's confused. He has moments when he's weak. He has moments when he's down. Don't put him on a pedestal so he doesn't tumble down. Don't do that. It's not fair to any man. There must be times where he can be okay to be himself. My husband will be past okay, but he's kinsly to me. We have moments where we laugh, we talk, we just... I don't expect him to be preaching sermon to me 24 hours a day. I don't expect him to always speak the word to me, thou art my wife, thou art what thou preparest for dinner to us or that. Have regular conversations. Play with him, laugh. He's a man. He has needs. He has needs. And this also means that when God warns you about something concerning your husband, realize that it's possible. Too many pastors wives have destroyed their homes. When the Holy Spirit has said, oh, that his daughter in the Lord should not be near him. You must say, my husband, hmm. My husband is a man of God. He can never do that. <laughs> My sister, all men can be tempted. It is the Holy Spirit that helps them to stay true. All men can be tempted. So if the Lord is pointing you in something, put your eye there and pray. Don't say, My husband, no, my husband, <laughs> my husband is above this thing. Your husband is not above anything. It's flesh and blood. 
So pray if God is showing you something. Your husband is tempted to steal money and God is showing you. Pray. Oh. Don't say my husband, my husband can never, never know. If you speak English that nobody sent you. Your husband is first a man before he's a man of God. So if he doesn't, don't let it pain you too much. The same way you tell other people to forgive, forgive him. The same way you tell other people you preach love, love him. Practice all the things you've been preaching. Okay, guys. I hope this helps you and I pray you never make any of these mistakes. So I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Hey people, so if I have never invited you to be a part of Praying Pastor M, let me apologize officially and let me take this opportunity to invite you to be a part of a very growing family on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, please follow me at Pastor Mildred and join me 3 p.m. every day, West African time, to be a part of what we do. Um, it's just a time where we get to learn about the Word of God, have fun, talk about real life issues and just connect with each other. So please be a part of it every day of the week, Monday to Saturday, 3 p.m. with p.m. Praying with Pastor M. God bless you.